Welcome to episode 271 of School Librarians United. I am your host, Amy Herman. This podcast is dedicated to the issues and challenges school librarians face every day. As a school librarian finishing my 17th year, I knew I wanted a podcast which addressed the nuts and bolts of running a successful library program. I don't claim to have the answers, but I hope that this is a platform to share resources and exchange ideas. Now is a perfect time to mention that all the ideas and opinions expressed in this podcast by myself, my interview guests, and listeners who reach out to the podcast are our own and do not reflect those of our school districts. When incorporating research, I always make sure to cite my sources. So whether you are a novice or a veteran school librarian, this podcast has something for you. Friends, you don't want to miss our next book club. Jared Amato, creator of Project Lit, has a newly released book. Just read it, Unlocking the Magic of Independent Reading in a Middle and High School Classrooms. See the link in today's show notes for the instructions and the 14 questions from which you can choose to focus your response. You are invited to then send in a voice message response no later than May 31st. This upcoming episode will be a compilation of these comments, reflections, and strategies we can enact in our library programming and spaces today. Check out the link in today's show notes and be a part of this collaboration. Amanda Jones's upcoming book, That Librarian, will be available starting on August 27th, but you can pre-order your copy now. And if you use the indie bookseller Cavalier House Books in Amanda's hometown of Denham Springs, Louisiana, you will get a signed copy. I've included a link in today's show notes. When you look at the cover of Amanda's book, you might recognize the Freedom Fighter shirt that she's wearing. She reached out to the designer, Christy, who then designed a line of That Librarian apparel, as well as That Librarian flair, such as a bag, sticker, and mug. I love that we can all be That Librarian who advocates for our library and our students' access to books. You will find a link to the online store in our show notes today. Please note that 15% of proceeds go to the Texas Library Association, as that is the home state of the designer. Summer in the States is fast approaching, and if your district allows you to have some say in the professional development hours that you earn over the summer, consider using this podcast. In every episode, you'll find a link to an editable PD certificate, What administrator would turn away free, customizable, and convenient PD hours? I've talked with school librarians who are permitted to choose the episodes which address specific goals and areas that support their own programming. Some districts even used Google Forms and other similar forms of record keeping, so ask your administrators. You just might be pleasantly surprised. Friends, I welcome you and all listeners to reach out with your feedback and episode suggestions. You can reach me either on Facebook, on X, formerly known as Twitter. My handle is at LMS underscore United. On Threads, you can find me at School Librarians United and on Blue Sky at SLU Podcast or the email address schoollibrariansunited at gmail.com. If you include your mailing address, I'll be sure to send you a podcast sticker. And now a word from our sponsor, Capstone. Capstone is an innovative publisher and education technology provider of children's content for school libraries, classrooms, and at-home learning. Home of the award-winning PebbleGo Research Database, Capstone has a passion for creating inspired learning and intellectual curiosity in children, and I am so excited to be working with them. I'm also grateful to Capstone for their continued commitment to support the podcast in Season 6. They are offering listeners of School Librarians United a very special discount. Visit shop.capstonepub.com and use the code UNITED to get $20 off an order of $100 or more for both print and Capstone interactive ebooks. That's code UNITED for $20 off an order of $100 or more for both print and ebooks on shop.capstonepub.com. And now for today's episode navigating self-censorship, and my conversation with Jamie Becker. Jamie Becker, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. You know, thanks to social media, you and I can actually identify the first time we connected, the spring of 2021, You and I collaborated in May 2021 on episode 126, juggling our many roles. It's fair to say that you are still juggling your many roles. That would be an understatement. Let's just call it an understatement. (laughs) There's different roles, but there's still many of them. Exactly. Well, in that case, you're in good company. 
it's always nice to know that that other people are experiencing many of the same, you know, feelings when it comes to being overwhelmed. And and so I'm grateful you're here today. Would you, for listeners who haven't met you before, would you introduce yourself? Uh, tell us a little bit about your library, the grades you serve, and some of the programs that you offer. Well, all right. Well, I am Jamie Becker. I am a high school librarian in the rural outskirts just outside of the St. Louis area. I like to call it sub-rural because it's not really suburban. It's not very rural. It's kind of just just on that cusp of that area there. As I said, I'm high school, served 9 through 12. I'm also, I should mention, I'm also a doctoral student as well. So that's kind of where those juggling of roles kind of switched up a little bit. I know I had some other things I was doing before when I was juggling some roles. Now I'm juggling that instead. So talk about some juggling difference of juggle and roles going on there. As for programs offered, I mean, I've got all your typical programs. I've got like the state reading programs going on. I do real, what I think is kind of cool. I've got my, I call them library ambassadors. It's our state library club that I have a chapter of. We just went to our state conference uh, last month and my kids just loved it. It's the first time we got to go as a chapter. Only a couple of my kids got to go, but they just absolutely loved it and we're so excited and can't wait for the next one but these kids it's not like book club per se but yeah they do reading too but they help me run in my library we've helped out the elementary with book fairs they're actually helping me do a big weeding right now getting ready because I'm moving into brand new high school because my school has grown so much that we've outgrown our space and so they're helping me weed making sure I'm not over weeding to where it's like no, maybe Becker, you should keep this book. Or no, Becker, get rid of this one. This one's like, uh, should have gotten rid of 20 years ago. Yo, this needs to go. And so they're really kind of making sure that I'm not like overdoing it, but not underdoing it as well. So I really, it really helps to get their perspective in things. And so they kind of do a lot of things. We'll do like fun little things, crafts and stuff together. Really just, for for me, I like that club specifically because it kind of brings kids that don't always do other clubs a lot of times. Like I have several of them who they're not in any other clubs but that club. And there's ones who do lots. And so I've got that kind of mix going on there. It's really, I really like that club. I love that. You recently gave a presentation at your annual state conference, and we are incredibly fortunate to have this opportunity to share this presentation with our listening audience today you know, before we dive into the substance of your presentation, I'd like to ask you about your disclaimer slide. And friends, you're going to get to see uh, Jamie's entire presentation that's linked in the show notes, as always. But you you do include a disclaimer slide. And it kind of reminds me of every intro that I provide in the episode. It's very similar. So could you give listeners who've not had a chance to, to get that sneak preview, can you give us an idea what are the kinds of things that you say, I assume... This disclaimer comes with all of your presentations. Um, actually, I, I've really only given a couple presentations ever. And this was actually the first time I've ever done this before. And this actually came based on one of my mentor professors that I worked with. It didn't come from her per se, but came from when I was talking with her, working through um, what I was going through, what I was going to say, how I was going to say it. She was started to ask me questions like, what if someone challenges you on certain things? Or what if someone says certain things here and there? Because what I'm presenting on with self-censorship can be a tough topic for librarians and people can feel attacked by it. And so I felt that I needed to put this in that, look, I'm not an expert here, but I also, I don't have all the answers and I'm not here to judge you. I wanted to make sure that, and I actually, during my presentation, I said that a lot. I'm like, I'm not here to judge you because there are situations that we all have. I can't predict them. And just because there are those situations doesn't make you a bad librarian. You may have to self-censor your library for a certain reason. And that's a thing. I'm not going to judge you for that. I'm just here to inform you of what it is that self-censorship is to make you aware of it because you might not know what you're doing. 
you might not know that what you're doing is self-censorship. And really, it's just, because it's such a tough topic, I just want to make sure everyone in that room was comfortable before we even got started. So just kind of laying it all on the line, just saying, hey, we're all here. And the theme of the conference was we all belong here. And so I just want everyone comfortable laying it out there before we even began. Well, and I'm always aware that when I have a guest on the show or several guests on the show, that we are mindful of the listening audience as also being present in this conversation. It gives me the permission to ask questions, which might not be pressing in, in my mind, but but also I when thinking about what our listening audience might be wondering, but it's always an exercise in reflection. And I, I think that's something that's wonderfully intimate about listening to these conversations because uh, our listeners can, in participating in, in the listening of this activity, can also ask those, those difficult questions of themselves. This is an exercise in reflection. And regardless of where you are in your career as a school librarian, it is an opportunity for you to ask those difficult questions and acknowledge that on some level, we've all had to, in some ways, compromise what we do, sometimes in self-preservation. We, you, know, you will be no good to anybody if you lose your job. And, and that is out, out of, straight from my professor at, at library school, Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan. You do no good sitting at the curb. If you do not have a job, you accomplish nothing. So you do have to be mindful that when we are doing our jobs, if we jeopardize our job security, we have to reevaluate what we're doing. And that's exactly it. And that's why I'm like, I know that there are situations and there are librarians out there, school librarians out there that have to make those choices that, that they either do this or they lose their job and they've got to feed their families. And that's why I'm like, I'm not judging anyone. And I don't want to put that out there to make you feel like I'm going to be judging you. That, that was not my intent. I just want to inform people on something that I've been learning that I think is fascinating, that is hopefully going to tie into eventually my dissertation research at some point as I'm getting along there. And so as I'm going along this kind of pre-research route, here's what I found so far. Fantastic. You know, unveiling perspectives, navigating self-censorship in school libraries was the presentation which you gave. I'd love to know, and you've sort of hinted at this, what motivated you to select this topic when you wrote your proposal? Because obviously you wrote your proposal a long time ago, months and months and months before your state conference. It can require such an investment in your time and your energy and your bandwidth, your mental bandwidth. So why now? Why did you decide this is what you wanted to present on? This actually came out of final paper for one of my classes. And it was just more of kind of an exercise to get us starting to think about what we wanted to write for our proposal. And I'm still, again, I'm not 100% settled on exactly where I'm going with it. I know I want to look at book banning and school librarians in some way. I'm s still kind of shaping all this and it, I kind of keep getting pulled in one direction or another. It's the way it is. You think you're going to go one way when you start a doctoral schooling and you kind of, yeah, you usually don't end up where you start. I've, I'm finding and everyone tells me that and they're so true. But we did this paper and I'm like, I kind of have something here and I'm looking at this conference and I'm like, you know what? Why not? Let's just give it a shot. It's a hundred words that I got to put in for this proposal to submit to see if they'll accept it or not. And I get this notification that they accepted. I'm like, oh, crap. They accepted it. Oh, now I've got to actually put something together. Crud. <laughs> but I had a foundation and I've had, I have great, I have great mentor professor that I've been working with. And I have a couple other great professors that talk and work with me. And I've been really fortunate in my program and through other things that this has come about in such a great way. And I've been really, I think this has really been a great thing overall for me to have come about. And I got a great reception from the people who attended my presentation. And I feel very fortunate. 
Well, and friends, I got to say, one of the things that I was really excited about when I saw that, that Jamie had given this presentation, you know, when I was a baby podcaster and I was just really just recording myself, reading off of a script, and, you know, I felt so strongly about certain topics. So if you look at season one, as cringy as those episodes are, because it's just me, myself, and I just by myself. And so, yes, the first 30 some episodes are completely just solo effort on my part. But you have to know those topics are ones that I felt comfortable talking about. And one of them, episode 17, recorded in January of 2019, way back then, was an episode I did by myself called Self-Censorship is Real. I'll be honest, full disclosure, I never listened to it again after I recorded it. And that was that was years ago. Uh, Truly, I would like to think that I have grown over the years. There's there's some acquired nuance. And but I'll be honest, you know, when I think about recording a topic back in 2019, flash forward to now, five years later, you know, friends, anytime you look at something from season one, first of all, do not feel compelled to listen to it, but always feel the need to say, hey, you know, I realized you talked about something five years ago. Could we talk about it again? Yes, absolutely. So that's why I was so so incredibly excited because I was like, you know, we've talked about this once, but God almighty, that was five years ago and it was just me. And it, it certainly didn't have the kind of research and the, the that Jamie has done with her presentation. So thank you so much for, for joining us today. You know, so we're all on the same page. Would you just provide a distinction between censorship and self-censorship? Certainly. I do want to preface that everything that I have in my presentation is all uh, research that I've found. And everything I have in my presentation has citations to it. I can't, I put it on the slide, but I do have full citations at the end because and nothing is anything that I've done because it's all just what I've read and found because I'm not to that point yet. I'm not at that point in my in my career, in my life. I give a shout out to everybody's work that I read because I read a whole heck of a lot. <laughs> I swear. I think I think I I think my mind was spinning half the time from reading all this. But I just want to shout out to all all those amazing researchers that I look look up to and look to be someday. So I just want to shout shout out to all of them. But when we're looking at censorship versus uh, self censorship, when we look at censorship, we're just looking at the basic objection that's made about a book and it's usually based on some kind of some kind of objection sometimes it's language some kind of other offensive thing you know that sexual material that we don't like or the other like something age what they call age appropriate okay well we know that's subjective at best we we won't get into that whole mm. but and so someone makes a motion of some sort usually a recommendation to have it removed from the space. And when you get into self-censorship, there's actually, it's, there's considered two different types. Depending on who you talk to, we won't get into that whole hoo-ha either. Uh, from what I'm looking at, I'm looking at two different types. Preemptive censorship is the fear that it may happen. And so the librarian will not purchase the item at all. So they're looking at it before they even purchase it. They're not going to touch it because they're worried that something is going to happen because that book is, has something of a controversial nature of some sort. Whereas ex post facto self-censorship, and this is a phrase um, from what I can tell is coined by um, April Dawkins, who's an assistant professor at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. Basically, that's a decision that's made by the librarian to remove a book after it's in already in the library. And this is without going through that reconsideration process. So it's just basically, it's pulled off the shelf without any thought of like going through a process, going through a committee, any of that, it, not even, no challenge, nothing. It's avoiding that challenge. It's just pulled off the shelf, said, nope, we're going to put it to the side. We're going to take it away. We're going to put it in a restricted section, et cetera, et cetera. And so for the presentation, I lump those together. Just otherwise I'd be going back and forth and back and forth, and back and forth. And quite frankly, we consider all of that self-censorship I don't think anybody truly thinks about one versus another when we really think about it, but there really are two different kinds of self-censorship. 
Well, and you know, I'm I'm thinking about uh, my first library, and when when my principal swoops in and uh, says, "Hey, Amy, where's that book, Lane Smith? It's a book." And I said, "Oh, um, it's right here." And she goes, "Thank you. It's going into my office." I was like, "Whoa, wait, what? What's going on?" And she's like, "Yeah, so Lane Smith, it's a book." Uh, I've actually emailed with with Lane Smith, and uh, was he is very aware that his book gets censored all the time, gets pulled off of shelves, and uh, it's it's fantastic book. I highly recommend it. But it was it was my first experience with somebody just just taking the book and saying this doesn't belong in your library, and it was like wow. And somebody me, if that happened to me now, I'd like to think that I would have responded differently. When you realize that there's a problem with a book that's in your collection, you have options. And it's different when you're a novice, when you're just starting, versus someone who has those years under your belt. That That's different, too. If, if I would think about what I would do when I first started, and I'm in a situation like that, versus where I am now, I, my response would totally be different. I can guarantee it. So, yeah, I can see that happening the same way. Absolutely. Many of us are painfully aware of censorship, uh, initiated by community members or family members, or even, as in the case with me, a school administrator. Uh, Self-censorship, however, is somewhat off the radar. And for that reason, we really, it's harder to have those kinds of statistics to compare with just how frequent censorship is say, from outside forces, uh, you know, and how that impacts our library spaces. Well, we can pull from different resources. At least 70% of school librarians likely self-censor. School Library Journal reported just in 2023 that 75% of librarians self-censored just based on sexual content of books. So, and that actually can be up to 90% when you look at elementary and middle school librarians. But it does drop to 75% for high school, so they're a little bit more tolerant, apparently. But still, that's large. Three-fourths of librarians will self-censor something in their library because they're concerned about that, which is just mind-blowing to me that they're willing to do that. And it, but I understand it, too, in a weird way. It's, it's such a weird dichotomy. I get it, but I'm also freaked out about it. <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just say I, I will be completely vulnerable and throw myself uh, out there because, friends, I clearly have no problem with being candid with our listening audience. Uh, you judge me all you want. If you're still listening, thank you for tuning in. I'm going to think about when I do my book purchases. And uh, I, I, we are making... So, I mean, when you think about all the decisions you're making in the in creating that book order that's going out, and and obviously the books on that list, you have made an active choice to buy those books because you have deemed whether it's something that supports the curriculum, something it fills a, a you know books that were lost from last year that never came back, or students have required them. But let's also remember that there are a lot of books you didn't buy. And, and we can pat ourselves on the back and say, well, you know, with the money's limited, money's limited. But if you think about, and this is where I'm guilty, think about why you didn't buy them. Because you can tell yourself, there isn't enough money in my budget, or there isn't a demand for that book. But ask yourself, is it, is it that the real reason why you're not buying those books? Because for me, self-censorship is almost about what you don't do. Because when you buy the book, you know, that's an affirmation. But if you don't buy the book, that is self-censorship. You are, you're preventing that book from being here. And as the person who buys the books, if you do, you're actively choosing against a book. That That's actually exactly it. It, it really is. And I, I know I'm guilty of it too, is like, am I doing this because of this reason because I just ran out of money is am I guilty of it because are my kids really going to read this or are they really not going to and especially after doing a lot of this research and stuff 
I've really started to take a second and third look at what I'm buying and why I'm buying it. And I kind of go, okay, I'm running out of money for this. Okay, you know what? This is going to go on next year's budget. I'm just going to push it to next year's budget because I think it still belongs in a collection. I, I'm, I feel, you know what? I might feel X, Y about it, but it's not about me. I can feel all I want about it, but I've still, it belongs to the collection. It fits this. My kids are wanting it. I don't see anything wrong. It belongs here. One of the discussions that actually came up, which I found very interesting from my presentation, was with the publishers. The ratings that we're getting, it's not always what they, what our, at least the librarians are feeling, is conducive to what's in the book. Because as we know, we can't read every single one, and we're dependent on reviews and what the book publishers put out is the audience and stuff. And so that's another thing I'm starting to kind of look at for myself is like, hmm, does it kind of fit the same things as the audience and the reviews fitting what's in the book? So I don't know if that's something I'm going to kind of look at too, because that's something that got really brought up within the conversations I was having. I'm like, that's a really interesting point because we're trusting what our reviews are saying, especially if we're not, because we can't read them all. I would love to, heck yeah, but we're dependent on outside people who we're trusting and we're saying, hey, we're trusting these people. I will will be very honest that when I purchase, I, I have not necessarily had as much money as I would like to have to be able to buy books. But when I do buy books, I, I, I know I, I overthink it like so many of us, and some of our choices are easier to make than others. But I'm going to tell you right now, I put a great deal of credibility in the recommendations of my peers. And by peers, I mean my virtual PLN. I mean, like the people when when I'm on, a, you know, school library, social media, and I can really get a sense for what people feel about books that are going to fly, books that are really going to be popular with my students, or books that are really going to do a, a good job of providing that that wonderfully diverse and a you know, rich collection where students can see themselves on, the, on the, the covers of the book and on the pages of the stories. I want to go back to this idea of this word appropriate because it's such a loaded term. <laughs> it is a loaded term. And I, I, I always hesitate to use it, but it's, it's stuck in my vocabulary at the same time. It's, it's, it's a nasty little word that has so many connotations that you can't win with. It's like, who's appropriate for what? It, it's who's appropriate for what audience and what what thing and who decides that? What's appropriate for my kiddo may not be appropriate for your kiddo. And that's okay. Well, and you want to see a fight break out on, on Library Facebook? Library Facebook, first of all, folks can get super mean, super mean, super fast. I, I'll, I'll admit, I, inf I avoid library Facebook sometimes because I, I swear. Mm -mm. If somebody phrases the question, hey, is this appropriate for middle school? Sweet Jesus, just back up because <laughs> it is about to go down. Because you saying, is this appropriate for X? Yeah. Is this appropriate for Y? Is so just, again, you really have to be very tuned in to this idea that when you say that, you are expecting that you're ideals and your values are going to somehow magically match up with somebody you've never met on library Facebook. You know, so again, there are certain words in my vote that just don't come out. We don't say things like appropriate because it, it is that really there's no stuck in my vocabulary and I can't make it go away. And it's so frustrating to me as much as I want it to. And it just flies out of there. And it's one of those, I want it to go away. Because I know it needs to, and it doesn't want to. It's like, go away. Appropriate is not the word you want. I'm going to tell you what, I totally succeeded in eliminating the word normal from my vocabulary. I don't use the word normal. I have not used the word normal. Here, I'm using it in this context. But, but one word that I've managed to completely eliminate from my day-to-day -day is the word normal. Because again, another real loaded word. There, you cannot use the word normal and not in some way pass judgment on whatever the topic is. Because if something's normal, then something is not normal. And you're like, nope, we're just... And then you know what I do? I substitute the word typical. And it, it's done. We fixed it. Now, have I found a substitution for, for the word appropriate? I have not. <laughs> so we're kind of stuck. We're kind of stuck. 
And see, in writing, writing, I'm great with it. Writing, I'm great. But, but talking, nope, my mind goes mile, mile a minute. Just friends, just don't use the word appropriate. It's, it just means there's, there's so, it's such a judgy word. At the risk of stating the obvious, what, according to the research, because friends, I, I love when somebody does their homework and, and this is where we cheat because Jamie's done all the work and we just get to sit and listen to all the research that she has, you know, brought together for the purposes of this conversation. But at the risk of stating the obvious, what are, according to the research which you have found, the primary reasons that librarians self-censor, that they actively decide not to bring certain titles into their space or have made those titles disappear? Oh, those are some of my favorites. And I use that sarcastically stating, by the by. Mm -hmm. But I mean, probably the biggest is that fear of controversy. I mean, th who wants to deal with the controversy? Who wants to deal with a book challenge? No one. No one wants to deal with that. I mean, seriously, I, I like a good fight as much as anybody, but <laughs> I will argue as much as much as anybody else. But I don't want to deal with that. I don't want to deal with all the hassle that goes around with that. And then having to deal with some of the list that some of our friends in other states have to deal with. Oh, my goodness. I, 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 mm, I oh, thank you all for your tenacity because mm, I just have to say that. But anyways, the fear of losing their jobs. We were talking about that earlier. There's there's a real fear of that. And it's reasonable. I mean, if you're being told remove this or you're not going to be rehired next year, that's a reasonable fear and completely understandable. And there is a thing uh, that shows that those with less experience are more likely to feel this way, which I mean, you're less likely to be tenured, obviously, and you're less likely going to be comfortable in your role. Well, can I interrupt you right there? Because I've, I am aware I, in my talking to librarians around the country and around the world that tenure is something that from many states doesn't exist anymore. And I, I don't take it for granted, but I have heard when I was in Tampa last fall at AASL that some states have done away with, with tenure and uh, removing that protection. It, it, that's one thing. Yeah, that's one thing to be very aware of. And so, and I've also heard of librarians who have been, they didn't lose their job, they've been reassigned. So, so being pulled and, and all of a sudden being pulled from your library and being assigned to a classroom. Friends, it's been two decades since I've been a teacher in a classroom. And if somebody pulled me from my library, I would have a very large problem on my hands. <laughs> I have, unfortunately, a dear, a dear friend who, um, because of some controversies and I, I more power to her, I love her tenacity and a shout out to her. I'm not going to name her, but she knows who she is, that she got reassigned to a different library because of things and basically is being pushed out because of things. And I love you, girl, but it sucks. And I love her for it, for her tenacity and for standing up for what's right. I'm just going to say that. So we're going to leave it at that point. Other things why librarians tend to self-censor. The subject matter of the book is too controversial. They feel it's too controversial. Whatever that means to them. I'm not going to say what it's controversial because that's not my definition. It's that same like what's appropriate. That's same kind of thing. We're, that controversial is another one of those that's like appropriate. It's that loaded word going on there. Perceptions and reactions of the community. I definitely can understand this one. The more rural you get, I'm a, I'm a city girl. I'm I'm from Chicago originally. So for me, working in a more rural environment where I actually see the people like in the community more and like interact with them compared to when I was a kid. That's a huge thing for me. That's a whole different ballgame compared to when I was a kid. I, I grew up in a school. My school had like 2000 people, I, the 2000 kids. I, I didn't know half my classmates, for goodness sake, that I graduated with. And now I've got the school of like 550 some the whole different ball game going on there. So that perception of the community is 
a big thing in schools. And then that personal support, admin support, if you don't feel you're going to be supported, if you feel like you're going to be thrown under the bus, that's huge too. If, if Why would you set yourself up for being thrown under the bus? You know, I was awfully curious, and I'm, because I wasn't in on your presentation when you gave it in person, could you explain the slide that uh, talks about why books get censored, digging deeper, and it shows this difference between the librarian's comfort level and the principal's comfort level. And it, it, I just would love, give us, give us an idea of what this looked like when you were presenting it, because it looks fascinating. I love this slide. I love this slide because this was a study done, again, by April Dawkins. I shout out to her because I, I just love her work. But it's comparing what the school librarian's comfort of putting certain subject matter in their library versus what they believe their principal's comfort would be of having that same subject matter. So mind you, it's not what they know, not what they've been told. It's what they believe. And so this was a survey done by her. And so this was a different percentages. There was norms and all that stuff. I left all, all, all the extra stuff that goes into actual surveys and research I, I kept it to the bare minimum just for ease of knowledge and getting info out. But what I found kind of interesting was that school librarians felt that their principals would be most uncomfortable with having books with violence, LGBTQIA materials, and offensive language more than anything else. And really of interest that they believe that their principals would be more comfortable with a book that was sexually explicit versus that that had LGBTQIA content. Now, mind you, it didn't say sexually explicit LGBTQIA, just LGBT material. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Well, and again, you know, this is where that researcher in you gets to do those, those deep dives. And I'm very grateful, our listening audience. I love when somebody does all the work and, and brings it to our attention. So, so thank you so much. I feel like we're playing a game of never have I ever. But uh, uh, yeah, I think this is one of those, you know, never have I ever committed self-censorship and I'm going to be like, nope, I have. And I think our listening audience would be somewhat relieved to know of the frequency with which it is believed that school librarians have had some experience self-censoring in their collections. And I think this was the example I used in my own personal experience because this was very early in my career. But we had those DK eyewitness books and and it was the Renaissance one. And the kids, I always saw were these just horde of, of these young boys. These were all fifth graders. And they were all crowding around this book. And I was like, oh, my God, did they bring a Playboy to school? What did they do? No, no, friends. It was the DK eyewitness. And that was the David. Or it was, you know, one of the, they, they were looking at the Renaissance paintings of, of many of these, you know, oftentimes not just scantily clad, but just, you know, nudes. And of course, they're in my library. And of course, they're looking at this book. And I was like, you know what, friends? <laughs> Mrs. Herman's just going to put that book in my office. And I didn't say this. I just like, all of a sudden, it went in a pile somewhere. It's, it's crazy. I don't know where it is, you guys. <laughs> and there we go. I, I did it. I self-censored. I pulled the DK Eyewitness Renaissance from my elementary collection. I want to say I've done something with graphic now. I can't remember because my mind is not always clicking the way it should. But I want to say that I've pulled a book or two at some point as well for whatever reason. I can't remember why, but I'm pretty certain, especially especially early in my career when I was in the elementary library, I'm 98% certain that I pulled something for some unknown but probably stupid reason. Now we get into some nuance, some splitting of hairs. We aren't self-censoring. Rather, we just aren't selecting certain titles for our collection. Does that mean that selection is actively deciding for a title and self-censorship is actively deciding against a title? It definitely could be, could be splitting hairs. I, I can definitely see where that can come into play. To me, it really comes into the fact of what are your reasons? What are your reasons for selecting or not selecting? And 
and it really comes down to are you selecting or not or really are you not selecting it because of the certain criteria are you not selecting it because oh i just don't have the fun so we're just not going to ever get it or are you putting it to next year's list and saying i'll get it next year because it deserves to be in there or are you just waving away with the whole there's no demand when have you even checked have you even asked and surveyed your kids if you haven't at least done some due diligence that to me is a big difference between that whole selection versus self-censorship and again I'm no expert but that's that's how I interpreted a lot of what I was reading was those type of things would be that kind of splitting hairs are you really doing some due diligence are you really and no you can't put everything in your collection so some things you're like yeah no this is you know what historically these things don't ever check out Uh, that's there's just no reason let me let's check with these kids really quick is this one gonna really check out okay no you're not feeling it either okay uh, cool yeah good And forgive me, but you've talked, you know, you've raved about this group of students you work with. You have this panel of informed readers who could give you a very good sense before you buy something. And they do. Oh, trust me, they do. It's easy for us to say, oh, there isn't a demand for a book because nobody's ever asked for it. And that is not the same thing. Just because a student hasn't actively come and said, hey, do you have this book? doesn't mean that they wouldn't like to read it if it was on the shelf. And I I think that the better you learn about the readers and the the students that you support in your space and the teachers that you support, you're going to have much better sense. And and obviously, if you worked closely with a teen advisory board or a, uh, you know, your your ambassadors to, uh, you know, your library uh, minions, whatever you call them. And I actually ask, I'll even ask outside of them. I'll look at some of the ones who are kind of like, not even just the reluctant readers, but some of those that I know are maybe in, like, the uh, those pro- the programs where they're helping to work on the reading skills, for example. And like, hey, would this be of interest to you? If, if do you think if I got this, would this be of interest to you? And they'll some of those kids, especially, they'll tell me point blank, it's like, no, I'm never gonna touch this. Okay, good to know. I will. I won't get. I, hey, you're gonna tell me on this. I appreciate it. I need to know these things. And things like that help. One of the wonderful things about meeting with folks like Jamie who have done these presentations, they've done their homework, they bring it all together, is that invariably I'm going to learn things I have never you know, come across before in my adventures as a librarian. And I'm going to be completely honest, never have I ever gone to booklooks.org. And this was eye-opening. <laughs> so... Jamie does a side-by-side comparison of book resumes versus booklooks.org. My goodness. And while I was aware that it existed conceptually, um, I'll be honest, I've never read any of their reviews, and boy, did I get an education. (laughs) So it's interesting, you know, and friends, again, visit the link in the show notes to take a look at this. But when you're looking at a side-by-side comparison of of these two. And by the way, the wonderful thing is uh, whenever I come across librarians who include books as examples in their presentations, you have to know last weekend I read the book that Jamie used in here called How It All Blew Up by Arvin Amadi, a fantastic story. I had to read it because once I was getting ready for this episode, I was like, well, if Jamie used it as her example in her presentation, must be a fantastic book. And so I had to had to listen to it. The audiobook is wonderful, but it has themes of Islamophobia and homophobia and about a journey about a graduating senior and uh, fearing rejection by his family and his community and, and really about self-discovery, but fantastic. But you put the two books together, book resumes and how they portray it, and then book looks and how they portray the same book. And it's really revealing and you have to appreciate that if you only see one of these, you're going to come away with a very different understanding of the book because it's written from a different perspective. 
And I did this on purpose. This was also one of our state nominees, I want to say two years ago, maybe. Uh, I'm like, it was either two or three years ago. But I purposely did this to show kind of an example of someone's mindset. It's actually United Against Book Bans versus Book Looks. Basically, giving the book basically a whole overall opinion, not just taking just one part of the book and deciding that because of one part of the book, you're going to take or or keep, take it and put it in your library or say, nope, not going to happen, versus saying that because of this, this, and this, you should not have it in your library. And I, I felt that that would be a relevant visual comparison of kind of what we do as we're going through and looking and searching for books, reading reviews, doing all these things, looking through our PLNs, which I think is a fabulous idea. By the way, I didn't get to say that earlier. I think we all should be doing that more, searching our PLNs for book recommendations, FYI. But I really wanted just to make a comparison visually. And that's why I came up with this. It wasn't really to say, hey, here's blatantly how someone might view censorship in that, but more just to say, here, look at these two, and here is someone's mindset, possibly. And here's one thing that's giving this whole representation. It's telling you about the book. It's telling you what awards and accolades it's given. It's giving you what the recommended age range is, what the grade level range is. It's giving you all this pertinent information versus very much a book summary, which is maybe a sentence long, a summary of concerns. Okay, so there are concerns. So that right there is telling me this something is bad about this. And then it has content warning at the bottom. And that's for, that's supposed to, it's supposed to make you feel scared. And so that's me right there. It's like those two different mindsets going on. And yeah, if you're only looking at one, and if and if you're using these two, and I'm not meaning for somebody to use these to choose books, not at all. That was not the purpose of this. It was just to purpose to give a visual representation of a mindset. Well, and it's confirmation bias, because if you look at book looks, you are going to feel good about your decision to not have this book in your collection. On the other hand, if you were looking at book resumes and looking at the accolades and looking at how many different themes and, you know, looking at this as a more holistic approach, I, I think, again, it's confirmation bias. If you, if you are bent on making sure that this book never makes it into your collection, well, you, you've got something that would back you up in regardless of, you know, again, you got to consider the source. And, and that's exactly what those who are trying to make others take books out of libraries, they're using these types of sources, which those who are dealing with self-censorship in general should be aware of, but they should also be aware of other sites as well, which I kind of want to not push so much, but just make people aware of so they know that like, hey, there are other, there are things out there. That wasn't my total goal. My goal was to just get that visual representation of what mindsets should could be. So self-censorship will undoubtedly help you avoid conflict with the alarmist community members whom, and possibly your administration, but it always comes at a cost. Because if you don't buy those books, then there are students who will not have access to them. And to assume that if our students can't get the books in our library, they're just going to go on Amazon and buy them. No, they're not. And some kids may, but you got to remember, if you don't buy a book, that means that it's not available for students to enjoy. Or that they could just go, just, they could just go to the public library. I, I'm, I'm sorry, my kid has no access to a public library nearby. Our closest public library is good six, seven miles, maybe, from us, maybe. There, there ain't no way that he's getting there anytime soon. Yeah. Ours is three walking. miles. Yeah, three yeah. miles from our school. Now, and that's crossing a major yeah. highway too, mind you. 
Yeah, I, I, my library is not in walking distance easily for, for any of our students. Uh, so no, you know, and again, you know, putting that burden on the student is, is really, that's unfortunate. That's something that we're trying to avoid because we want to make sure access is everything, right? Access is absolutely everything. And that's why I put some student quotes in there. These are actual students, actual quotes. I had to <laughs> narrow one of mine down. One of my students just talked for like, like five minutes. I'm like, yo, child, <laughs> I don't need that long. So I like had to pair it. I'd like break it down. I'm like, okay, where's the dots? Where can I put, put, put the dots in there to like get what you're saying? But there are actual quotes from my students just like, I'm doing this presentation. What, what do you have to say about this topic? How would this affect you? And so... I want to get, let people know their voice within this, too. No, that's important. I want them to have a voice. You know, you spent some time talking about selection patterns. And I'm hoping you'll go into some detail about this because I was not familiar with the term selection patterns. So can you give some context for this slide? That's the same type of thing of really thinking about, it kind of goes back into how are you selecting your books and goes back into what are your reasons for it and what are your reasons for not selecting? It's that same thing. How, are you looking for reasons to reject a book? Are you looking for reasons to select a book? Are you going through like those two websites? Are you purposely looking for websites that are like, oh, that says that that has such and such in there. I can't have I can't have a book in there because of that. Well, at that point, yeah, you're looking for reasons to not select that book. That's a selection type pattern going in there, versus again those whole things that lack of funds, lack of uh, that no demand. If you're telling yourself that, that's a pattern of selection. You're saying, oh no, I don't have it. I don't. My kids don't want that. No, or or there's one that I love that's like. I've, I've actually heard, well, m my kids don't need LGBT books. They're too young for that because they're in elementary school. Um, yes, you probably do have children who either have or know of family members even who are LGBT. They need to, they can have representation too. They, and usually those books are within that, we're going to use that word, age appropriate i know i know but that's why you can't see me but it's in finger quotes i promise <laughs> it's in finger quotes age appropriate type of ways they're in child wording that's 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 for their developmental level it's it's not going into that high school adult level of wording it's for that young age it's okay but i i've actually been on in a group of librarians that had elementary librarians well and these were four award nominees for the state where they we can't put that in in our library we can't put lgbt books in our library are you serious okay i just sometimes i just i i have to hold my p's and q's because some in that case those are those are selection patterns that are by choice that versus the that's a self-selection of choice versus the self the actual preservation of a job or preservation of the the, the need preservation that's a that's a choice that th those are the ones i have trouble with i'm gonna put this out right now i have i cannot recall ever having interviewed somebody who is now working off a list meaning i've never talked to a librarian who's ability to purchase is dictated by a list of approved titles. And I don't expect anybody to come knocking on my door and saying, hey, I want to do that episode. But I am aware, I am acutely aware that there are colleagues around the country who are limited in what they can purchase because the books have to come off of a, an approved list, which has been approved, unfortunately, by many people who are not librarians. They include community members. They include people who have never uh, stepped foot in a school library, never stepped foot in a school, and do not have any sort of uh, qualifications whatsoever except that they are 
individuals in the community who feel that they have uh, a vested interest in what our students can and can't read. So again, I am I, my heart goes out to our colleagues for whom choosing books has that that has really been removed from them because what what they are able to get has to come off of a prescribed list. Yeah, and that and that's a whole different that's that's not self censorship. That's forced censorship. So that's a, that's a whole yeah. different forced that's censorship. That's just censorship. That's, yeah, yeah. That's just not okay. You know, Jamie, I want to make sure that listeners hear the reasons why having a selection policy is in place. I understand that for many people this is a given, but not everybody has a selection policy in place. Please, for the benefit of everybody tuning in, make sure that we appreciate why this is so vital in in today's in today's world. I mean, in today's world, I mean, it really is beneficial for you to have a strong policy in place and detailed too. have that collection policy in collection development policy in place. I mean, it really will. And while it's not a catch all, it it can it can't do everything, plain and simple. Some people will go around it. I've heard and know stories about that. But really, it, can, it will give you details about it should say, where are you getting your materials from? Where do you consult uh, your information for reviews, like professionally sourced reviews? Though, again, we know that's not the be all end all, but at least that's a start for where you're getting information from because we, sh- we do trust them. But not only that, but along those same lines of those reviews, educating your faculty, administrators, school members, educate them of this policy. Educate them about the legal rights of students, making sure they're aware of these things. Educate them not only about book banning, but educate them about both sides of it. I I always feel that it's it's better to know both sides. Yeah, you're going to have people who are going to like, why do I have to know? (laughs) Because it's better to know. Just just because it's better to know. Because I said so. (laughs) Well, and I find it incredibly empowering that you end your presentation with this responsibility that we have to educate our school, our administrators, the faculty, the board members. And that is a, it, it happens all the time. We have, we embody this advocacy for not just our space, but for the role that we have in that space. And, and it can sneak up on you. You have to be ready at any time to be that advocate. I think it's why so many of us choose to wear advocacy when we get dressed in the morning. It is why we have the displays in our space that we do. I know today, uh, I, I knew they were coming, but I had forgotten that our state DEI committee was coming through our county and, and my principal chose to use the Learning Commons as a place for us to host part of that day because so much of what uh, DEI is about is embodied in the library space. And you better believe they saw advocacy from the moment they walked in there. They recognized the values that I hold near and dear. And and this, this opportunity to educate the people who come through our doors is it's a daily thing. It's a constant thing, not just during open house, not just during, you know, our back to school nights, but but whenever we have guests in the building, because the messaging starts as soon as they they cross the threshold. It really is. And and the more we can educate everyone, hopefully things don't sneak up on us. And that's why we have to have that those policies in place and then educate them of those policies. And so when they're educated of them, they won't try and sneak around them. Hopefully. Hopefully. (laughs) Jamie Becker, I am so grateful. You know, you and I connected years ago, and I am so grateful that you are part of my virtual PLN. Would you let listeners know how they can uh, follow you? Because I I really appreciate your candor. I appreciate your ideas, and I, I can always count on you. So would you let us know how we can find you on social media? I am most active on the uh, social media, formerly known as Twitter. I re- I dislike calling it its current name. I am um, changed my handle. It is Librarian of Note. I'm also on several other socials: Blue Sky, uh, Instagram, by the same handle. Uh, I think those are the only ones I've te- 
tend to be at least somewhat active on, but I'm mostly on, again, the one formerly known as Twitter. Mostly. (laughs) Jamie, I hope you have a fantastic rest of the school year. We're winding down. We're in the home stretch. Thank you so much and have a great evening. You too. Thank you so much, Amy. It's been a pleasure. Friends, in between the time that Jamie and I recorded this conversation and this episode was edited and posted, School Library Journal shared out an article written by Andrew Bald titled The Cover-Up, Under Pressure, Some School Librarians Alter Illustrations to Avoid Book Challenges. I've included a link in today's show notes. What I find incredibly fascinating is that the type of self-censorship addressed in this article wasn't even addressed in the conversation that you just heard, altering a book from its original published form, even while keeping it accessible on the shelf, is still a type of self-censorship. And in keeping with my commitment to be entirely candid and forthcoming with our listening audience, I will share with you two examples from my early years as a school librarian. It is possible I mentioned these in my earlier episode, which I recorded five years ago, but the examples that I recall from my earliest years of being a school librarian involved an exacto knife, which did live in the drawer that was closest to me at my circulation desk. First of all, and I'm going to date myself, and I think the name was Nintendo Power. And this was one of the very few magazine subscriptions I had when I started as a librarian in 2007. And in 2007, I had a library and I inherited this subscription. And actually, it was phased out probably within two or three years after I started. And so I I didn't have this issue for very long, but I did notice that there were some ads, which, and if you appreciate, I was teaching in elementary school with my oldest students being 11 years old, and some of the nature of the uh, advertising was definitely intended for an older audience rather than my, my, uh, my, you know, my preschoolers and my, uh, my elementary kiddos. So it, I did take it, an exacto knife to a couple pages, which absolutely would have created a, an issue for me in my, my first years. And, and, you know, that's, I'm not proud of that, but I also recognized that because this magazine was one that was probably intended for an older audience, I needed to do that. Uh, I was also a rookie librarian and making rookie mistakes. The other example, and I've been trying to to figure out if I can back this up, but I had some very old copies of Guinness Book of World Records. So if this was 2007, um, these copies would have been three or four years older than that. So unfortunately, I don't have any way to sort of, you know, back this up. I don't have those copies anymore. But it was brought to my attention by one of my students that they had in there on one of the pages a picture of a woman with the who held the world record for the largest breasts. And I just sort of said, oh, thank you for bringing that to my attention. And I went through all my copies of the Guinness Book of World Records. And I've, I had them, I, I kept them in all my libraries. But I'll be honest, I only ever found this particular record being pictured in the book for one, and it was the oldest edition I had. And I I wish I could say I knew what year it was, but I never found that record being showcased in pictures in the Guinness Book of World Records that I would have purchased like at the Sam's Club or Costco. So uh, unfortunately, my X-Acto knife uh, did its its job and uh, I did remove that particular picture. It was one picture from one book and it never happened again. And I strongly suspect that the Guinness Book of World Records figured out that it probably was not in their best interest to have a photograph to represent this particular uh, world record. So I'm just going to be honest. Yes, I did uh, mutilate, in this case, a Nintendo Power and a very old copy of a Guinness Book of World Records. So there you go. I I am flawed and always trying to do better. 
Friends, if you found this episode helpful, please share it out with your team, your PLN, and on social media. Be sure to follow on your favorite podcatcher so you'll never miss an episode. And if you really like listening today, consider leaving a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. Reviews help others find us. A couple important reminders before we wrap up the show. Use the code UNITED to take advantage of Capstone's generous $20 discount off an order of $100 or more. Friends, I also hope you consider sending in your voice message and have your say on the next podcast episode. Visit the link in today's show notes. Join us for our next book club episode when we read Jared Amato's brand new book, Just Read It. See the link in today's show notes and you will find 14 prompts, which I hope you will consider sending in your response by May 31st. Friends, I appreciate your understanding as I am scheduling episodes and working with school librarians, all of whom are wrapping up their very busy school years. So I can promise you this, our next episode will feature a school librarian showcasing all the amazing things they do, and hopefully you will enjoy the resources that we have to share and the conversation. So I hope you'll tune in.